Orthopedic Soybeans Chapter 21. Um, very interesting. But before we get to it, let's talk about the skeletal system because the skeletal system talks about bones and bones and bones and just about bones everywhere. So let's review it. This is the same information you got from uh, San Antonio. So let's see what we got. Now, these are just some facts that you'll see when it comes down to the human bone. You'll realize that there is 206 bones in the human body. Now, even though there is 206, what they're talking about in this instance is that they're actually focusing on an average person, not a child, not an infant or a pediatric patient. Those individuals will have uh, higher numbers because their bones are still forming. Uh, all their bones are still forming as you go up. Now, the smallest bone that you see will be found directly in the ear. I think we talk about ENT two days ago. So you'll find the smallest bone in the ear. There are three bones in there. Uh, you'll find the smallest bone right in our location. The longest bone, of course, you know, is the femur. Where is the femur located? The thigh. In the thigh, that's absolutely right. You'll find the femur in the thigh. And that one to pretty much make up uh, almost quarter of the body to the, to the weight. Just the femur alone, you know, that shows uh, how heavy it is. Uh, the largest bone that you see, even though the longest bone is in the femur, the largest bone, that's what you see with our wings. And those wings will be located in the hip. So the hip bone will be pretty much the largest bone that you see. Uh, kind of have like six different bones that join together to hold our body together. I try to hold the gluteus maximus and the gluteus medius as well. Uh, most of our bones, majority of our bones that you see will be located in our phalanges, whether it is the, uh, the hands or the upper extremity or the lower extremity. But you'll find most of those in those areas, the hands and the feet. Uh, bones are normally light, they are normally lightweight and they only account for about 14% of our total body weight. Now, you see what this statement is kind of contraindicate, uh, contradicting one another here. It says bones are lightweight, making only 14% of our total body weight. But now, it also says that the femur is the longest bone. But what does it do? It makes up almost one quarter of the body total weight. So you see, even though for uh, the bones are lightweight, that 14% of the total body weight, the femur is taking over and making significant contribution when it comes to that. That's why uh, it's kind of like one of the heavy bones that you'll see. Uh, bones happen to be four times stronger than reinforced concrete. What this means is that um, if you look at the chemical composition of bones, what we're looking at all the calcium and all the sort of uh, chemical compounds combined together, and then consider the chemical compound that we have in concrete, you know, uh, the chemical compound in uh, in a bone is way much stronger than that you will find in the concrete. That does not mean that your bones is very strong than the concrete, so you can go, you know, give it like a, a, a nice little punch and you expect you to walk away scratch free. It's not going to work that way. They just look at the chemical compound. So hopefully, nobody is going to go punch no walls with some concrete brace and assume that their bones is stronger than it because it ain't gonna work. One person will be laying down to one side. Uh, overview that we'll go over real quick uh, for today will be, uh, we'll talk about the bone structures, uh, how bones are normally formed, the healing process that will occur when a fracture does occur in patient, uh, divisions of the skeletal system. There are two major divisions. We'll talk about those two divisions, uh, the two divisions will go along. And we'll also discuss bones of the ace skeletal system. That's one of the divisions of the skeletal system. The second one is the uh, appendicular skeletal system. So the division of the skeletal system will be these two, the isoskeletal and the appendicular skeletal. So we'll talk about those two uh, moving forward. And then we realize that we'll talk about some of those different joints in there. Uh, because when uh, I think hard now, you might be doing total, total joints, total hips, and total joints, but now uh, you probably saw some of these things occurring. And we'll talk about some of them so you can actually see what we have moving forward. Uh, bone structures and functions itself. Uh, we'll talk about parts of long bones and uh, the cells of those uh, of those different bones. And to talk about the, part, the parts of long bone, the long bone we're talking about now, we are actually focusing on the femur or the tie bone. So let's look at the parts real quick and then we'll transition and talk about those different cells that you see uh, in the bones itself. This is what you will get uh, for the femur. 
you realize that you have two ends, the distal ends and the proximal end. And what happening is that uh, if you look at the distal, the distal end, you have some cartilage on here. But the distal end, we recognize this to be the epiphysis. The epiphysis is down here. There's another epiphysis up here. Those epiphysis just shows the ends of the bone. Now, the distance that you will find or the diameter between the two epiphysis, the diameter between the uh, proximal epiphysis and the distal epiphysis will be considered the diaphysis. Best way to remember it is that uh, one up here, one plus one down here makes that two. So dot di pretty much is two. That's one way to remember it. Another name for the diaphysis as well is also considered the shaft, the shaft of the bone. Now you'll see the articular cartilage that will be on the upper end, spongy bone. Spongy bone will always be found in the, prox uh, the proxima and the distal epiphysis. We'll talk more about those uh, spongy bone later on. Even though it's kind of like looking, it says spongy bone, though some means it's actually soft, but we'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, the space that you see occupy uh, in that spongy bone area, that's considered the red bone marrow. So in a nutshell, you realize that a, a red bone marrow is actually located or it can be formed directly into the spongy bone, not the menduri cavity. Okay, red bone marrow will be in the spongy bone location. When this bone is growing, what happening is the spongy bone you see up here will actually be pushing upward like the scene where you saw the, um, the integumentary system with the epidermis. It had like, I think, six different layers and the layers start pushing itself up. That's the same thing happening here. The spongy bone will be pushing upward. As it push upward, those spongy bone changes into a compact bone and actually that's how we grow. Now, up here, you can see the diagram up here per se, but if you look, maybe I'll probably put another picture so you can see. The only thing is that the school has hair copyrights to this one, that's why we're using it. But if you look up here, you will realize that uh, you see a thin line right here and another thin line right here. That is the epiphysis disc. That this is pretty much the growth thing. That's how we grow. Uh, but I'll talk to you more about it as we go forward. Moving down, endoosteum. Right, uh, you will realize it should be E N D O and then O S T E U M, but because we're combining those two, where well, you can have uh, two O's in here, so we can refer to our Indo Indostem, but it's like Indoosteum. That's what that is. So that's the inner part of the bone. You have the compact bone to be on this other outside part. Pretty much that's the uh, the solid part of the bone. You also have the mandurite cavity, which of course is in the middle within the mandurite cavity. You will find the yellow bone marrow. And then that flap you see or that sky you see around the bone will be considered the periosteum. That just means around the bone. So yellow bone marrow is found in the mandurite cavity. Red bone marrow will be found where? Where will you find red bone marrow? Inside the in the epiphysis, yes. Okay. Uh, same diagram you will see here, just kind of give you a little bit different picture, but it's the same thing that we're talking about, so nothing different. And then a compact bone, on the other hand, you realize that from this section of that bone where you see the uh, spongy bone, spongy bone, you realize it got a, little, a lot of different holes in it, where a uh, compact bone is a little bit different. So this section from here, ah, because the compact bone, the reason why it's called compact, you know what compact is, something that actually gets stuck together. That's what it is. So compact bone will be considered um, bone tissue that are tightly packed together. They are the strongest form of bone tissue that you'll find. Uh, they make up bulk of the uh, diaphysis or the shaft of long bones that normally provide protection and support for the human body. Now, that does not mean that spongy bone does not do any work, okay? Spongy bone still have its root function. It might say spongy bone, but the spongy part is because of the characteristic that it actually holds. Here, if you look at this diagram, you see the spongy bone uh, on this other section, you, uh, you will see holes in them. Those holes look like a sponge. If you pick a sponge up and look at the sponge, you realize the sponge has holes in it, right? There's nothing different on that. So, spongy bone, they are like them, they are very lightweight, okay, and they support and protect the bone marrow, definitely. But one of the things about distinction between spongy bone and compact bone is that spongy bone is kind of like a little bit 
softer, soft as in the characteristic between the two is spongy and compact foam, but it's not really that soft. Uh, it has holes in them, whereas compact foam does not. That's one of the major characteristics that you come across. Now, any questions about the bone itself as far as the location and how those different parts plays, play in? So the epiphysis, that's on the end of the bone, right? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, epiphysis, it, well, both of them will be at the end. And you'll definitely see uh, questions about this when it comes down to the CST exam. You'll see questions of them asking about the epiphysis uh, layer and the diaphysis, especially when we start putting the prosthesis in into our, our orthopedic surgery, when getting the prosthetic in, where are we putting the, prosthe uh, the prosthesis? Where are we going to put the bone cement for that implant to actually sit right in. Now the end, the distal part of that prosthesis, where is it going? Is it going to bone marrow? If it is, which location are we putting that in? So you see some of the things coming into place. For those of you that will be uh, in total joints and total hips, you'll see that you will definitely see those things. All right, let's move on to cells of the bones. Uh, we're gonna talk about different cells that actually make up the bone, keep in mind, because of our level, we don't go into details of the bone is so we just keep it very simple, but there, there are more parts of that bone than what we talk about. Now, uh, the way how bone normally form occurs in uh, these ways, in like three different, well, three ways I communicate or support one another. One of those things is the osteoblast, okay? Osteo means bone, so bone blast. Now, when looking at osteoblasts, we're talking about how bone cells normally form. They normally secrete a matrix, and once that matrix is secreted, it is then surrounded uh, by osteocytes. And this is what happens when our bone actually form. So you see this little one, you have the uh, osteoprogenator, you have the osteoblast that goes in, and then you have the osteocyte coming in here, pretty much surrounding the whole thing before you get into osteoclast. We'll talk about those things, what osteoclast is versus what osteoblast is. We're gonna to talk to you about it little by little. Because you see, it started here, very little. You see where the nucleus is located? All of a sudden now, it became a little bit bigger, right? It started getting additional characteristics. Now it's looking like a nerve fiber now. It's looking like a neuron, you know, and then move forward. We're gonna talk about the difference that you see within that. So osteoblast, is the bone forming cells. Just that cells itself, that's all it is. That's what osteoblast is. Now, the way how that cells come about is when we get into uh, reproduction, you have sexual and asexual reproduction, but mainly uh, asexual reproduction, what we're talking about, mitosis, right? You have one cell will come out, that cell has come down and then get into a formation to actually split when cytokinesis occurs, it splits out into two identical cells. Now, if that one cell was a blood cell that came back and split into two identical cells, the two identical cells will actually have two different functions in, in the process of differentiation. When that occurs, that cell, it, it, it could become a bone cell or it could become a nerve cell. If it become a bone cell, now that's the time osteoblast comes into place because now that cells will then be considered a bone forming cells. So that how that process starts or the how it becomes initiated. And it will move on. Once that osteoblast has occurred, that bone forming cells has been identified, we get to the osteocyte. The osteocyte happens to be that bone cells that were formed has become mature. Now it's about to carry out the daily cellular activity of the bone. That's what that would be. So osteoblast is like, look at blast. Instead of blast being like we're blasting things to destroy things, look at it as, you know, we're building things up, right? So osteoblast actually build. Osteocyte is that building that was actually uh, initiated has become independent and can work on its own. Now, once that one continues on, you have another one called osteoclast. Osteoclast is a little bit different, right? Uh, this will be like uh, the cells that comes from our white blood cells, like monos. I already know our white blood cells, what does it do? White blood cells tends to destroy any bacteria that comes into our, our system, right? It's like our immune system, it kind of fight off things. So osteoclast becomes that uh, bone-eating bacteria. 
but it, it is doing it in a good way, right? So uh, if for some reason you can bake, if you're a baker, you know, go in the kitchen to bake, you're probably gonna need some flour, uh, some, uh, how you call this thing? Uh, if you get some flour, you probably need some sugar, some eggs, some milk, and all those other things, right? If you get all those things together, that's the osteoblast because you're getting all the things to start forming things together now. As they get ready to form those things, as you get ready to form those things, you realize that some things will be going on. You have to mix all those things up. That mixture will actually occur in this area, in the osteoclast area, because you're mixing all those things together to get something different out of it. Now, at some point, those flowers that you're using, the flower normally would not. In most cases, you won't get all the flowers. So if you don't get all the flowers, one of the things, one of the best things that you would do is you will either get those residual flowers that are left around and then put some water on it and then start over, or you pretty much just toss it off. Now, that residual flowers that you saw that you have not done anything with yet, this is where that residual flower comes in because it was not part of the mixture that you had, just something that was on the side of the bowl or for whatever reason. Osteoclast would be that one. Since that bone forming cells was not utilized in the bone formation process, in order for it to go to waste, osteoclast will come in and then reabsorb it back into the body like it will eat it up and then send it back to the beginning, send it all the way back to an osteoblast to start all over. That's how it is. So you have osteoblast pretty much initiated as the bone forming cells. You have um, osteoclast, that will be the destroyer. And then you have an uh, osteocyte. That is the osteoblast has actually grown and become mature. So you have to understand how these three processes work. Now, there's a, there are a lot of different processes that get involved in between each of these layers, but we're keeping it to these three as much as we can. Any questions on these three? Osteoblast, osteoclast, and osteocyte? No, HM2. All right, all right. Let's keep moving. All right, so this is just to put it together real quick, how uh, to tell the difference between these. Well, osteoblast, bill, osteoclast, will add to the curve of bone. I'm just showing you how other things work. So this is a question for you. Let's see how much you pay attention. Uh, what part of long bone functions as the growing region? The epiphysis. The epiphysis plate, okay. Uh, what is the space within the diaphysis that contains the yellow bone marrow? The, what's, what's the space that between uh, the diaphysis, dialysis, uh, diaphysis. Is it the compact bone? Um, well, the compact bone is the, the, well, not really. the space that you find between the diaphysis where you find the yellow bone marrow. What is that? We talk about it. The uh, medullary cavity. Okay, the medullary cavity, exactly. That's correct. All right. Now, what is the difference between osteoblast and osteoclast? Blast is um, the forming, and then class is the destroyer. Okay. Okay, so blast is the forming and class is the destroyer. Okay, I'll take that. That's good. All right. Now, let's fo focus our attention on the bone formation. We already know how the bone are, where we go, what are those different parts of the bone. We understand, you know, we have osteoblast, uh, osteocyte, and osteoclast. Now, let's see how bones are normally formed. Now, the process of bone formation, we refer to it as osteogenesis or ossification. That's a process in which bone are, bones are normally formed. Now, we'll talk about how the process actually works. In, um, realistically, there are only two major types of bone formation. We'll talk about the two types here. Uh, it normally begins the first week of the embryonic life cycle when the child's actually in the mother womb. That's the time it will occur, and that bone formation process will continue all the way through adulthood. So as long as we're growing, we continue, I mean, as long as we live, we continue to be growing with our bones, or with our height or weight or whatever it is. Now, 
the thing, the difference between male and female when it comes down to height and other things like that is males don't really care if you mess up their height. Females, they do care. If they, if, I mean, if the height is like five feet and one inch, you better add a one inch on that edge that will have a problem because they think they earn it. So we have to take those things away. Not really done. But it's just them. Now, so bone formation, same we have osteogenesis or ossification. That's a process in which bone form. We have these two right here. Bones are normally formed by replacing an existing connective tissue in one of two ways. And this is how those tissue can be replaced. It can either become an intramembranous, uh, uh, intramembranous or it can be an endochondria. Now, intra means what well, within a membrane, right? Membranous is membrane. So within a membrane, that's how bone can be formed, or it can be formed by using a college. Endo is within. Chondra is a college. We'll talk about some of those bones that you'll see that are formed that way. Uh, in the chondra bone formation, definitely if you look at the, uh, the ribs, the ribs is all what? College, right? So that ribs, so is, that ribs is, uh, yeah, the ribs is formed by in the chondra, and we'll give you some examples here as we go along. So intramembranous ossification normally develops from layers of connective tissue. So you have a lot of different connective tissue comes together because that those are all membranes. That's how you find out a bone to be formed. Uh, they are very simple and is most direct form of ossification that you see in the human body. Now, some examples of these bones that are formed by intramembranous uh, ossification process would be flat bones. Now we all know there are a lot of flat bones uh, that you see mainly. Those flat bones will be located in the skull. And when we dissect those different bones location, where we got all the total 206 bones, you'll see the, the skull bone itself, it might be a skull bone as a whole, but it happens to have a lot of different uh, uh, sections of that skull bone. Uh, facial bone. Most of the bones that you find in the facial area will be considered a flat bone. Uh, the jaw bone, yeah, they don't really call it jaw bone. Jaw bone is like the layman term, but uh, we have other terms for it. Uh, for the jaw bone, we'll probably consider jaw bone to be like uh, either the cheekbone or the maxillary or the mandible, something like that. And then you also have the clavicles. The clavicles, uh, layman term, would be our collarbone. That would be considered a flat bone. Uh, that would be considered bone formations that occur within... Uh, uh, intramembranous. So that bone was formed by using the membrane. So those are some of the examples that you'll see and I will tell you how that bone formation normally occur when it comes down to intramembranous uh, ossification. If you look at this right here, you realize that uh, these bone cells, because we're using membrane now, it, it becomes a little bit different. We still go through the osteoblasts and osteo and all those other things. Remember I was studying there are other things involved within uh, those three layers that we just kind of left out. You see those cells, the cells is that this is the bone forming cells that are comes in and they have a collagen fiber that will be added onto it. When that fiber is added onto it, it's kind of condensed everything together because that just the uh, 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 master shimmer cells itself, it will come down. But the collagen fiber now will attach those things together. Once you attach them together, it starts changing it little by little. That's the time that you start observing or watching ossifications to actually happen within our ossification center because you have the uh, Masishima cells and the collagen fiber combined together to change that uh, bone formation process. When that occurred, what you get from all of it is the osteoid. The osteoid will be the smaller part that you see right here. The osteoid now will then be combined together to form this osteoblast. So a lot of things occur before osteoblasts occur, before osteoblasts actually happen. Now, what is osteoblast? Osteoblast is pretty much the bone forming cells, right? That's how you see those things happen. Now, the same thing happened down here when you start looking at the second uh, area where you have the osteoblast go in and you have the osteoid in there, the osteoid kind of connecting the osteoblast to make it a little bit bigger. You have the osteocyte. What is the osteocyte? The osteocyte is that osteoblast actually getting mature, right? To actually form a bone cells now by itself. When all those things happen, you start seeing new uh, classified um, bone matrix to start forming together, the bones start coming together, either changing into a spongy bone characteristic or start changing into a compact bone characteristic. And then down here now, 
if it is a spongy bone or a compact bone, it's that same blood cells formation start forming. So at least blood supply can reach to the bone itself and the whole process continues on. Next thing you see is we'll get into the endochondrial classification or ossification. What will happen is for endochondria will actually develop first as a hyaline college. Now that college is uh, at some point will be replaced by the bone tissue later on in life. All other bones are formed in this manner. So we talk about this right here, we spoke of bones of the skull, facial bone, jaw bone, or the mandible and the maxillary area. You have the clavicles. Those bones formation are formed directly by using membrane, formed within the membrane. Every other bone that you can think of besides these right here, every other bones that you can think of will be that of the endochondria. So the endochondria makes up a lot of the bones in our body. All right, this is how it will be done. You have this uh, college right here. It's still a college, it has not done nothing. You have the proximal epiphysis, the distal epiphysis, and of course you still have the diaphysis in there, but again, it's just a college. And then uh, as time goes on, you see it start changing a little bit. You know, things start changing, it starts seeing a little bit of bone formation coming on this side, on the lateral side, and they keep going on. As that, if, as the process continues, you realize you have blood vessels that form and all the things like that, and then it goes on. So this is way much different than that of the um, intramembranous bone classification. That's why at the end of this one, you'll see what a college at the end of the bone itself. With that college being there, it's still growing at some point by utilizing the, uh, the growth plate. Now, this right here, this is an actual case from a patient. Uh, from a rock, one of our, our fellow instructors was there, so he brought this in from one of his patients. What kind of bone you think this is just by looking at the picture? Is What's that? What's that? Oh, nothing. I didn't say anything. Okay. Do you think it's a bone of the upper extremity or the lower extremity? I think it'd be the... I can't tell if it's like on the, the leg or the arm. I'm going to... Take a guess. Arm. Upper extremity. Yeah, that is the upper extremity. And this was an actual fracture that occurred in Iraq when uh, my fellow instructor put this together. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so you can actually see this is a fracture right here. And that fracture, it might not be protruding outside, but definitely you can identify this fracture. What we do in cases like this now is we take an x ray. We cannot do external fixation. The only way this can be done has to be internal fixation. We can reduce the fracture open this patient up, uh, reduce that fracture, put some plates and screws in there, and hope for the best and allow them to heal over time. That's some of the surgery that you'll be doing. So let's just say that fracture do occur. If the fracture occur, we fail to perform that surgery. That bone will stay healed because the first stage of wound, of wound healing is quite inflammatory, right? So the patient is gonna bleed out. What will happen is the bone broke into two, and you realize that this whole, this entire area, once that bone breaks, that blood vessel is actually broken too. So that surrounding area becomes inflamed because you got blood that will be leaking that can go straight into um, the blood vessel, will be leaking out. If that occur, nothing happened, we have uh, phacocytosis and pinktocytosis. Now, phacocytosis, what that is, is that if the bone breaks, remember the pac I was telling you about um, osteoclast? So that Pac-Man will come in, and that will be the uh, phacocytosis. Will come in, and then will eat that dead bone, like those bone fractures that you found within this area. It will come in, and then eat that, and reabsorb it, and send it back for uh, reproduction. Whereas pinktocytosis will come will come along, and pinktocytosis, all that is, is that the cell is taking in fluid. So it's like Pac-Man eats. With phacocytosis, right? Phaco means, you know, destroying things. So Pac-Man will come in and eat those dead bones. But after eating, you get choked, you got to drink, right? That's where pinktocytosis comes along and then absorb all those fluid back into a system and then separate it and send it back for, uh, for repair. If that happens, this is what you will see here. You know, the, uh, that inflammation has reduced. 
a little bit, looking a little bit better. You still have swelling here, right? Uh, new blood vessels starts forming. You see your spongy bone because again, wound healing process will start. That spongy bone start forming in the end. It start changing to compact bone. You see how this is now looking a little bit better, but you can still show. Uh, you can still see a slight distinction. There is no surgical intervention on this one until when it finally heals. When you see that bone, that bone actually takes on different shape because it was never um, reapproximated to its anatomical structure. Patients like these will be okay with that healing process, but the function they used to do with that arms or with that extremity will no longer be the same. You, there will always be some type of discomfort somehow because the bone healed in a position that was not the anatomical position, so it kind of have a little bit of deformity in it. We can go in and fix it, but it'll be, you know, a little bit later, it'll be a waste of time, but it can still be fixed. That's why if a fracture will occur, we try to reduce that fracture as much as we can before the patient starts healing. Now, let's see who's paying attention. Maybe somebody will falling asleep. I don't know, I can see. Now, the skull bone, the skull bones and the clavicles are formed in this manner. What manner that would be? With a two, with a two bone formation. So which one would it be? Would it be endochondria or would it be intramembranosis? Anybody? The flat bones are formed in um a certain manner, right? And then the rest are formed in um Uh-huh. So what would be the, the skull bone and the clavicles? The skull bone and clavicles are considered bone. flat bone. So what bone formation would be considered mainly for flat bones? It was the first one you said, right? So you have endochondria and you have intramembranous. Interbrainous is the flat bones. Okay, and intramembranous, okay. All other bones are forming this manner. So what would that be? The the first one, the um the endochondria. The endochondria. Okay, that would be the endochondria. Now when blood escapes from a ruptured blood vessel, what is normally formed? If a blood escapes, so the blood escape from here, from that blood vessel, what's formed? Oh, it, uh, it became swollen. I, um, What's another name for swelling? What's the medical term for swelling? Inflamed? Hematoma. Hematoma. Yeah. So hematoma occurs. All right. Do you need a break? Uh, honey, you want a break? Just so you know, we got about 84 slides to go through. 84 slides? 84 slides. Yeah, we'll take a break, eight from two. All right. All right, let's take a break and then uh you want ten minutes break or five? Ten's fine, eight from two. Okay. Let's oh. take a break. When we we'll come back, we will continue from where we start from. Yes, eight from two. All right, so let's continue. We have our wonderful Functions of bone, yeah, pretty much the function of bone, you should know it by now. Uh, normally to support and protect uh, internal organs. One of the internal organs that it really does not protect is the spleen. That's one of the things that it does not protect. But it normally shape and form the body without our skeletal system or our bones, we would not be looking the way how we are now. You know, we'll probably be looking like, uh, one of those uh, characters on cartoons that I just, uh, have y'all watched, what is it called? Muscle Ball? There's this, yeah, this yeah, this jelly look. Jelly look. Yeah. 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 No, I haven't seen it. You have not seen it? Man, you behind. You way behind the curve. <laughs> but that's what bone do for us. It normally protects our organs. And one of, some of the organs that you find, especially within the thoracic area, the heart, the lungs, uh, section of the kidney, you probably see most of the things would be in that area for protection. The spleen, not so much. That's why the, the spleen is the primary um, organs that normally rupture during car, uh, car accident, motor vehicle accident. 
Um, no, some of the function you also see besides the rotation is body movement. It eyes eyes a lever with muscles, so the muscles get attached to it, give a little bit of um, standing aid and other things like that. Especially if you want to sit down, walk, or if you start doing some run, yeah, the muscle will be attached to it to help us say, okay, yeah, extend this, no, retract this, go this way, other things like that. Now, blood cells formation can uh, occur within the bone. Uh, some of the places that you normally find those blood cells uh, at some point will kind of be within the marrow area where you will find those monocytes, where blood cells are lymphocytes. Uh, basophils, neutrophils, and uh, esophils, those are all wet blood cells that you definitely see and have specific functions in protecting the body against infection. You see some platelets in there. Now, some of the things that you definitely see is that for blood cells formation, you see some of the things occurring at different ages. Now, in young, uh, in other places that you see will be in the yolk sac, and pretty much the yolk sac will be for infants and pediatric uh, individuals, but lymphocytes will be for pretty much adult and the red bone marrow will also be for adults. But again, it says red bone marrow, right? Where is the red bone marrow found? In the epiphysis, right? Yes, HM2. Okay. Uh, some of the things that you also see that help us make our bones stronger will be these things here. And this is why normally with all these chemical compounds uh, compound combined together that actually support that statement that says uh, the bone, our human bone, is actually stronger than a reinforced concrete because of these chemical compounds. Uh, you got magnesium, sodium, potassium, uh, carbonic ions, and all this. If you put those chemical uh, numbers together, you get, get, I mean, you would definitely get higher numbers that would come out to it. Uh, do bones normally move by themselves when we walk, talk, or move around, or are they kind of controlled by something else? What makes them? What do you think? Controlled by something else. Controlled by something else, especially muscle. Um, let's see. They don't move by themselves. They move because we actually have that pull or uh, push or pull type of reaction with the muscle as we move along. Now, let's talk about divisions of the skeletal system. We'll talk about two divisions here. You have the exoskeletal and the appendicular skeletal. When we talk about the exoskeletal, we're talking mainly about the head, the neck, and the trunk. And we'll tell you more about that trunk here later on so you can see exactly what that is. But exoskeletal is pretty much those three, head, neck, and trunk. The rest of it, the remaining parts of the body, all belongs to the epidicular skeleton. The limbs and their attachments and all those other different parts, yeah. The skull. Now when we, start, when we get into the exoskeletal, now we say the head, neck, and the trunk, right? So for the head, you have the skull, uh, for the neck, you pretty much have the vertebrae cordon that kind of goes all the way down towards the thoracic cage. We'll talk about some of those things here a little by little. Within the skull, you have 22 bones. And all these bones, what type of formation do you think it will be? Uh, what, what type of bone formation would be the skull bone? The, um, oh, I know the name, I just can't. Would it be endochondria or intramembranous? Uh, no, it's um, membranous. It's inner membranous because it's flat, right? Membranous. Because then you have eight cranial bone and fourteen facial bones. All those bones, yeah, pretty much will be considered flat bones. So the, that would be the uh, intramembranous bone formation that you see when it comes down to the skull. The cranial bones of the of the skull. Uh, the reason why you see this cranial bone of the skull, even though we have eight, is because it actually encloses and protect the brain. And when we get into uh, some of those surgeries, you realize when we start doing craniotomy, we'll have to go through those different layers and then we'll get to the meninges layer. We'll have to go to, through the dura matter, the arrhythmia, and the, uh, the pain matter. We'll talk about some of those things later when we get into the surgical uh, portion of it. Uh, these are the bones that you see. You have the frontal bone, uh, the parietal bone, parietal bone. You, you have the uh, temporal bone. Temporal bone, you have two of those ones. Occipital bone will only be one. You have the epmoid, spinoid, and the epmoid and spinoid bone. You probably saw some of those ones, like the epmoid and spinoid um, membrane. You probably saw those in ENT, uh, in ENT surgery. But this one gave you a pretty, pretty good um, um, picture. You're looking at facial bones itself. For the nasal bone, you have two because they are both on the lateral side of the medial aspect. Once you make that uh, midline incision, it will be on the lateral aspect of it. Uh, Palatine bone, there will be two because you have two different palate. And then you have the maxillary, 
the max where you have two, that two max lara you, you, you're looking at, that only occurs if we have a midline incision on that patient. Mendable, there's only one, which is a little bit weird because hey, you have maxillary to be two. If it is the maxillary is two, what the ramus is, I mean, the mandible is, is one, right? It's kind of weird because the, that mandible bone actually goes all the way up with that ramus bone actually connects uh, the uh, zygomatic bone joint area there. So it kind of like looks a little bit different. So zygomatic bone will be two. That would be like your, your cheekbone. You have the vomer. Vomer is only one that's looking at right in the lacrimal bone because we have two eye sockets. So you have two lacrimal bones that will be within that area. And then you have the inferior nasal country that you will identify two bones in there, but you'll realize that there are three nasal country that you see inferior, superior, and of course the, uh, the medial aspect of it. But this one we'll talk, we probably already talked about in ENT, I think. Other bones that you see that we don't talk about a lot is the higher bone. Now, this bone, you have to be very uh, careful with when we start doing emergency tracheotomy. Uh, we do not want to start cutting over this bone because it will give us no access to the, uh, the trachea during emergency trachea. Uh, it looks like a U. It's not attached to any other bone in the human body. Definitely the only place you'll find it is located in the neck and that's it. So for male, it will be easy for us to identify that bone because if you look at it, it's actually slightly below, I mean slightly above the Adam's apple, it's slightly above it. A female will be a little bit hard to identify. Now the vertebral cordon that you will see, this is going towards, uh, from the hair going all the way down because we talk about the exoskeletal to be the head, which is the skull, the neck, and the, uh, the trunk. So this vertebral column goes all the way down past the trunk. So it start from the cervical vertebrae, and we have about seven cervical vertebrae. In the skeletal system, we have seven, but when we get into the nervous system, it will actually change. It will change to something that will end up having like eight, only because of the way how the nervous system works. It, come, it sometimes innovates some of those different location of it. Uh, from there, you have the thoracic vertebrae. Thoracic vertebrae runs from T1 down to T12. That one remains constant with both the skeletal system and the nervous system. You have the lumbar vertebrae that's a lower aspect of it. It runs from L1 to L5. And then you have the sacrum, that'll be from S1 to S5, and you also have the coccyx from C1 to C4. But those bones will be fused together at some point to look different. We'll talk about it a little bit when we get into the, uh, the nervous system. Uh, some, uh, that'll be cardio when we get into vascular surgery. Yeah. All right. So let's take a look at other things that you'll see. This one, pretty much the same thing. You just break it down a little bit. But here you will have this one to be broken down. The cervical vertebrae say it consists of seven vertebrae. You have the atlas to be the very first one. That'll be the C, uh, C1. And what that does is it just helps um, support balance of the head. Uh, the uh, acids will be C2 that provide that pivot for the eyelids to move around. So the eyelids kind of like hold it in place to balance it and the other one just go in the opposite direction. And then you can look at the rest of it whereas you have to turn by our cervical vertebrae, the fourth cervical vertebrae right away down. But this one will just keep it very simple for you. We don't discuss more uh, more in depth as far as what those different locations and names of vertebral columns are, because we can take those apart and actually have a detailed study of it. Now you come down to the thoracic vertebrae, like I was telling you earlier, it goes from T1 to T12. And those T1 to T12, most of it will inhibit uh, the, uh, the ribs too, as well the ribs cage. So you have the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way to 12 uh, dorsal vertebrae. It's a dorsal because it's on the dorsal aspect, on the back aspect of the human body. That's why you see it's a dorsal. Uh, they are a little bit larger and kind of like say right in the uh, body of the vertebrae to articulate with the ribs. So most of those um, T1 to T12 look in the vertebrae column. Uh, not the vertebrae, but the ribs column. And they have the lumbar. The lumbar is a lower aspect of it after we uh, deviate or move away from the, uh, the vertebrae or the, uh, the ribs cage. We kind of move a little bit down. So vertebrae bodies are normally large and strong because A, it kind of bears most of the weight that you will see from, uh, from our head, especially if we start putting too many heavy stuff on our head to transport and all the things like that. They support more body weight 
than other vertebrae because of that location in which they are. Now, in most cases, when we start doing some lumbar procedure on patient, it will actually be between the lumbar region. Uh, in real cases, we ever go to the sacrum or the coccyx. In most cases, it will be the lumbar region that we have to be working on. Out of that, this has been that uh, intervertebral disc you see in between here. I let it bend chip aside because of too much friction. We have to go in place that way. We normal that most of the uh, neuro uh, I call it neuro procedure will be done within a lumbar area. Uh, lumbar area. In real cases, you probably you probably probably find the sacrum, but not so much. And then the sacrum is just triangular. From you realize this to be just five fused bones that actually come together. Uh, have a strong foundation for the pelvis greater. So this one will only be affected if that patient happens to have some problem with the hip. But as far as, you know, towing heavy loads and other things like that, putting too much pressure on the act on the uh, axis and the atlas or trying to balance that head, that will occur in the lumbar area. And then we have this other one now. Keep in mind when it comes down to the uh, nervous system, even though this bone is actually fused together, and you have five bones fused together, the nerve that innervates this one will be a little bit different. We wouldn't need one nerve to do the job for these, uh, for those four or five different uh, bones that fuse together. But when we get into the nervous system, I'll show you the distinction between those two. And then you have coccyx. Coccyx, we normally refer to this as our tailbone. In some surgical intervention that we normally do, the tailbone refuses to close completely. It's either open on the outside, or it's pointed out on the outside that causes the cerebral spinal fluid to actually leak. Uh, for those type of cases, when we get into the surgical intervention part, we'll talk about it so you can understand how those uh, cases are normally done, how we can prevent that from happening in the future. But again, this is just for bones that are fused together. And then you have the thoracic cage. Yes, that's what it is. If you look at the thoracic cage, you have the sternum. The sternum is in the middle of the thoracic cage. So, Looking at, can you see this mass moving up and down? Yes, I seem to. So right here, this entire spot, this is the sternum. This is where we want to place our hand when we're doing CPR. Mainly, we try to come right here, uh, we try to come between the body and the xiphoid process. We do not want to put pressure on the xiphoid process because if this breaks, we have a problem. But our hand will be somewhere between the body and the xiphoid process. So when we start doing uh, emergency um, fluid, for patients that give you emergency IV with no access to a vein, you will have to do it right up here in the uh, uh, mini beer. We just kind of stop them with, uh, I forgot what the name of that wonderful instrument is that we normally use for IV. When I think about it, I'll let you know, but mainly we can do that too as well if we need to. Uh, so the thoracic cage, not only does it support the shoulder greater in the arms, it also protect uh, our vascular organs. And some of the organs you find, you know, like I told you, would be like, um, you'll see the uh, heart, the lungs, uh, sometimes the kidney, you'll definitely find the liver will be hiding in there somewhere. So you normally have protection some of those things. And it also functions in breathing because you have the diaphragm, uh, the diaphragm muscle will be right here to help uh, us to breathe uh, easily. Uh, it's called the thoracic skeleton. Uh, why they call it thoracic skeleton, that's a different story, but you realize that uh, you will see that this thoracic cage will have all 12 pairs of ribs attached to it. Now, the bone formation for this one, what would this bone formation be? What process of bone formation would this follow, the thoracic cage? Would it be mitochondria or would it be intramembranous? Oh, say it again, Intramembranous. Would it be endochondria bone formation or intramembranous bone formation? Endochondria. Definitely would be endochondria. Yes, you are right. It would definitely be endochondria. And there's a reason. There's a reason for that. There's a reason why you will see that to be endochondria. Always have a reason for it. And one of those one of those reasons for that happening is that um. If you look at, if you look at the, uh, I think they all do the, the, the region, the nine regions. I know you did the four quadrants, but were you ever, did you ever do the nine regions at all? No? I'll take that as a note. Oh, sorry, my, I didn't realize, I, uh, I don't think so, it's true. Okay, all right, that's fine. Uh, so, 
one of the things that you'll realize is that uh, when we're talking about the endochondria, when looking at the nine regions, there's a reason why we have the nine regions. Uh, so we divide this area, the thoracic area, into nine regions. So uh, let me see. I'm, I was trying to see if I could draw it for you to actually take a look, but for some reason, my drawer is not. Let me see. I can't get rid of this. Okay, now let me try it one more time. Maybe this will work somehow. All right, let me pull this. Can it be moved? No. Oh, man. It's not even allowing me to move it. Man, that is so weird. Okay, I can show you that. It's not allowing me to move. Okay, that's fine. I will show you something else. Uh, so we have something called the nine regions of um, the body. You have the quadrants and you also have the regions. When we're dealing with the, uh, the region, it allows us to identify what those regions are. And those regions definitely help us in understanding what we're getting ourselves into. How can we identify that location? How can we help the patient? Or how can we use terminologies to identify locations of the organ? That's why uh, endochondria is very important uh, to us. Let me see what I can find here. I will show it to you here in a minute. Okay, so I just went online and this is what I got. I think you can see this picture right down here, All right? So this is this is the nine region I'm talking about. So if you look at the thoracic uh, the thoracic area when you come down to the abdominal area. Now, right here where you can see, you see where the thoracic cage is, right? And we told you that this is the uh, endochondria bone formation. So right down the middle, you realize that's the umbilical region. That umbilical region. Follow down the line, I'll tell you exactly where you will find that area, what type of organs will be in there. But once you identify the umbilical region, you realize that there's a hypogastric region. That hypogastric region, that shows that hypo means below. So that means it is below the stomach. So you have your umbilical here, you have hypogastric below the stomach, and you have epigastric. That means this one is actually above the stomach. So where you think the stomach will be? The stomach will be somewhere within uh, the epigastric, the umbilical, within the epigastric and umbilical region. That's where you find the stomach. So once you get this part correct, you should be fine. The rest of it is very easy. Very easy. We talk about the bones, right? We talk about the lumbar region. We said lumbar region is from L1 to L5, right? So if you look here, on the lateral side of the umbilicals will be a lumbar region because again, the thoracic region is coming from T1 to T12. T12 will probably stop like somewhere right in this area. The same thing you find right here. That's where T12 is stopping right like in this area. But everything is joined onto it. See where T12 is? And then the lumbar starts right below that. So if this is the lumbar area, right in this line, right where you find this line right here will be your T12. So that makes it easy for you to identify what's on the left and the right side. In this area, you probably will be looking at the, gall, uh, the gallbladder, the head of the liver, I mean, uh, one side of the liver, and then you probably be looking at the head of the pancreas, and the tail of the pancreas will end up in the umbilical area. You probably see some of those things. Now, once you identify the left and right lumbar, because the lumbar area is here, down here is the iliac region. That iliac region, pretty much, you're going towards the hip area. So that's easy for you. But one of the things that gives students a tough time to, to identify is the chondria, right? So here we say the bone formation here is uh, in the chondria because we consider that to be, uh, how you call it, to be college. If the rib cage is made up of college, below that rib cage, that's why it's a hypochondria. That means below this rib cage now, that's the region we have there. So this becomes the hypochondria region below the ribcage region. It's seen on the opposite side. But that used to give, that normally gave a lot of students a hard time to identify. But now it should be easy for you. What we'll do later on is to identify some of these things. We just gave you the regions and you have to identify what organ is in that location. And that should be, it's pretty much, pretty much easy. This gave you an ideal location as compared to the four quadrant the upper lower, upper left, and all those other fancy ones. Uh, what are functions of bones? That should be easy for you. The score consists of how many? Yes, the, the score consists of how many bones? The score? Yes. 
Um, there's the mandible. Is it? You mean eight? Yeah, eight. Okay. Because we have the mandible and in the um the frontal. Okay. Uh, how many uh, pairs of ribs do we have? That should be. That's the main. Right. That should be twelve, right? And then the location for CPR definitely will be between the body and the xiphal process. We don't want to put our hand over the xiphal the process directly before we break it, but that will be the ideal location. Now, bones of the appendicular skeletal system, we're looking at the uh, pectoral greater, the upper limb, the pelvic greater, and the lower limb. Those are all, now this is us not going down to the lower extremity because we're already done with the upper extremity. The uh, acyl skeletal was just the head, the neck, in the, uh, the thoracic region, so that was easy. Now we're going to all those phalanges and all those simple things now. The pectoral greater, because this is the upper extremity that we stay on. You will see the function of the pe uh, pectoral greater is to support the arms and move attachment for muscles and all, and all this other thing. Now, in, in more detailed studies, when you get into biology and uh, anatomy and physiology at a college level, you'll get to understand what the names of each of these uh, groups is, but right now we just keep it very simple for you. Uh, now when we're talking about uh, pectoral girdle, we may consist of you know two bones in that area, the clavicles and the scapula. So the scapula is pretty much is something that we consider to be like the, the shoulder blade, like in the uh, in the on the back side, on the dorsal side, and then right up front you have the clavicle. You have one clavicle here on the uh, on the lateral side. You have another clavicle on this other in this other location. Now here. This is the front side. You have the zapper, I mean the, uh, how you call this thing? The zapper process will be like way down here. Uh, here you have the body of the sternum. This is the sternum here, and then here you have the ribs. But on the back side is where you find the, the, uh, the scapula. That scapula, you have one here and one on the other side. Within that scapula, within the head of the scapula is where that bone is normally connected, the upper arm bone, and we'll talk about it here in a minute. Now, so this gave you a pretty good picture. This is the back side. Looking at this, this is where you find the, the scapula and you have the clavicle up here. Now the upper limb that you'll be looking at, this is the upper limb that moves all the way down here. You have the humerus. The head of the humerus will connect directly into the socket of the scapula. We'll talk about bar and socket joint later on. That will be one example of a bar and socket joint. Uh, since we're looking at the anterior view, you have the una right here and the radius is on the other side. Now, the best way to identify the radius from the owner is when you put your thumb up and your thumb facing facing your mouth directly like you're about to suck your finger, that bone that's actually up, that will be your radius bone. The one that down will be your, your owner. That's how you can identify it. And then you go down, you have your coppers, your metacarpus, and your phalanges. All of this, that's why we're telling you, say most of the bones, half of the bones are normally uh, found in the uh, extremity. And that's what this is. Hemorrhage, you have two. One uh, left and right. You also have radius. You have two because you're accounting for uh, one radius here, one radius on the other side. Una, two again. You have one here, one on the opposite side. Uh, Coppers, you have sixteen. Now sixteen now actually goes. So you have you have to divide that sixteen between this one and the other side. So it's kind of like changes as you go along. Yeah, don't worry about that one. Fucking fingers. All right, so coppers, you got 16, but the coppers, phalanges, you have 28. The reason why the phalanges is 28, that's because the counting one, each finger got by three bones, right? So if you count all three, three times five is what? 15. So you got to count all those little things to move on to get those phalanges, bones up the finger. Yeah, you got to count everything. So one, two, three right here. One, two, three here, but you have this part on the other side and you got to do the same thing with everything else. That's how they get the numbers. But that's not important to you. Don't do that. Don't be punching no wall because your bone is not stronger than a reinforced concrete, realistically. But chemically, it is. Pepper grater, this is how it's going to look. And you see the coxie bone will be right in there. Uh, if you're working on CSR Miami trying to identify whether this person is a male or female patient, how will you tell? Is this a male or female patient? Uh, By looking at the hip. If the hip is wider, that means they are female. If the hip is narrow, that means they are male. I'll show you a good picture right here. So right here, you see how this one is? It's kind of looking narrow. That's a male. This one right here, yeah. wider. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. It allow them, uh, their hips get wider because again, uh, for that birth canal, that's why the hips get wider. Where I see it, you see it's very narrow in, in that sense. Let's go back to this picture. 
What do you think, male or female? That's a male. That is a male. You can either tell from down here or you can look and see how narrow this is. All right. Now you have additional one that will continue to do on lower extremity. The same thing, uh, the same thing apply. The only difference is now you have uh, the sacrum. Uh, the sacrum is right here, right in the back. The sacrum is connected to the hip bone. The hip bone do have name, but we'll keep it at hip bone for now. And then the femur, which of course is the longest bone in the body. Uh, the hip bone is the largest bone in the body. So you see how those two bones are looking. Mm -hmm. Here you have the patella. Right behind that patella, you have the synovial membrane. That synovial membrane happens to have fluid that keep lubrication and keep this joint moving back and forth easily. You have the tibia and the fibula. Now, we, only, we really do need our tibia, okay? I uh, will performing some uh, surgical cases where as the mandible is damaged with cancer cells, we can remove that mandible and then use the fibula to reconstruct the mandible so you can see that happening in oral mastofacial surgery. And of course, tarsal, multi-tarsal, and probably this, this is the same thing as uh, the coppers and uh, in the upper extremity. Yeah, same thing goes on. And then, yes, yeah, so who's paying attention? Let's see. What do we have? Um, what's new? You do know bones of the appendicular skeleton because the appendicular skeleton talking about phalanges and tarsals and all these things, so that's easy. Uh, I form an incomplete brain to support the arms, provide attachment for muscle, articulate with this. Yeah, something you already know. And then you have your wonderful joints. There are a lot of different joints, and most of the joints you can see it in your room, you can see on your doors. You can see in your cars and all the different things. You know, they, those joints can either be classified as immovable, slightly movable. Immovable is what it cannot move, right? Slightly movable or it can move by itself freely. Those are uh, different types of joints that you'll be seeing. You can see different human bodies making those different joints. Now, the immovable joints will be that of the skull. We call those uh, sutures. So those different sutures you see up here, uh, just holding those things in place. These joints do not move. If they start moving, something wrong. It will either move when it's broken into or it get broken by trauma. That's the only way it will move. Someone taking it out manually, okay? Uh, contain a lot of different fibrous tissue and cartilage that goes around and about. And then your slightly movable ones will be the ones you'll find in the vertebrae column. You know, it allows you to bend down, go left and right, move yourself, your body around little, little by little, you know, that's what that will be. And then you have your freedom movable joint. Now, this one now you get to see a lot of different ones. It could be your boy and socket joint, your birth set, it could be some other joint you find in the neck and all the different things. Those are the three types of joints that you come across. And you'll see a lot of different type of freedom movable joint, the hinge, pelvis, saddle, a lot of different ones. Uh, moving on, the shoulder joint, yes, that'll be a boy and sucker joint that you see right in this area. That's a boy and sucker joint, same thing here. And this is why you guys should be doing doing total hip. Replacing total hip or doing a shoulder, uh, I call it a shoulder replacement or something. This is a type of, uh, this way will be a, pros uh, a prosthetic that you have supporting and on the, um, on the head of the, um, of the femur, you will also have to pull this other prosthetic on there and then connect those two things together. So we'll talk about it when we get into the surgical part, hopefully tomorrow. These are just a lot of different joints uh, that you come across, hinge joint, and then you have this other one moving on in the neck, you know, different one. And then these are just ways in which you can move your feet around. So if you kind of like bend your foot, not be, you flexing your foot, you know, kind of flexing at the angle. Now, if you want to get it back, then you have to extend it. So you flex it, bring it up, you want to extend it, you let it go back to 180. If you bring it up to 45, you have flex, extend it out to 180, that's extension. Dorsal flexing, the same thing goes for your, your I call it, your foot itself, when you start looking at your, your foot towards the ankle, you start bending, that's why that would be dorsal flex. Dorsal means for a back, right? You turn the back, and then you're gonna bring it uh, forward. So you have um, on the dorsal side, bring your foot all the way up, and then you're gonna flex it toward the plantar side, like towards the, uh, the, the sole of your, your foot. Send it down, that's what you'll be doing. So plantar flexion and dorsal flexion, that's the example you see. Hopper extension, you do not wanna do this because if you do it, things happen. Things such as this right here. If you hyperextend that neck, 
you cause additional problem. And this one, that's why in a uh, surgical room, you always have the anesthesiologist in control. They determine when to move that patient. They have to give the count, and on their count, we have to correspond with them. If they say one, two, three, on three, we move, that's what we do. Because they have to control that, that neck because before we have to extend it. When you're doing CPR, you want to avoid hyperextending that neck to get air in the patient um, trach. You want to avoid doing that because, again, we will cause further problem uh, with hyperextension. Now, abduction, think about it. At ABD, that's going away. ADD, that's how you spell addition, right? Like add, ADD. So when you see that word ad, abduction, add, you bring it towards the body. Ab, which is the opposite of ab, as is you're taking away from the body. Those are just terminology you can get yourself familiar with. So if you're in the operating room and you say, well, we need to abduct the patient arms or we need to uh, adult the patient arm, normally this will happen in the operating room. It all depends. If the uh, nurse is trying to bring the patient arm to themselves so they can protect it and kind of keep it in the tackle wrap type of deal, they will do an abduction of the arm. If they're trying to put the patient in a cross position where they're laying down so they can pull safety strap on the arm, then they'll do the abduction one. That's what you normally see in the operating room, especially when the patient comes in now. Every surgical patient that comes in the operating room, we will always begin their surgical procedure by placing it in the abduction position. It's a supine position with the arm abducted away from the body. They will always be in that position. Once we get it intubated, now we can then confirm that position to what the surgical case actually uh, prefer to do. Rotation, the one thing you can do, be careful, because if you start whipping your head back and forth, you could get some problem with your uh, access and act that so you don't want to keep doing that over and over. Okay, you want to rotate your arm, but I mean, you want to rotate your head, but keep it simple and safe. So, uh, circumduction, that probably is something you guys do for a PT, like blowing some wind blow with your arm, turning your hands, uh, your arms in circle all the time. Pronation, pronation is very easy. That's like you being in a prone position. So pronation is laying your arm or your foot in uh, a prone position the upper side actually facing downward. That's how that is. Let's see what a supination. Yes, you go in a supine position, you kind of leave it. It's the opposite for pronation. You can see the example up there. Evasion, again, same thing. It's like you're turning your foot on the, uh, on the lateral side if you want to, and then invasion is kind of bringing it towards the medium, the medial side. So you turn your foot to the left, and you bring it back towards the middle. That's what that is, invasion and invasion. That's the opposite here. All right. Yes, look at that. We did all, all, all 84 slides. Damn, you guys are good. Oh, wow. Well. What questions do you have? Well, orthopedic. I mean, we just have a scalenta system. We have not gotten into orthopedic. Orthopedic will be tomorrow. Uh, at least this one gave you a slight idea on those different bones, where the bones are located. So when we start, orthopedic tomorrow, it can be a surprise to you. At least you'll be able to understand exactly what those are. Yes, you can do. What questions do you have? Um, I think I don't have it. You said there's eight um, bones in the in the skull, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. For some reason, I was thinking six. I don't know why. Six? I don't know. Like, I know it was eight. I know I knew it wasn't six, but, like, it was just sticking in my head for some reason. I just wanted to confirm. Um, I think I'm good for the questions. Honey, are you good? Uh, he had his eyes. Stop.